before we get to our ongoing lesson in Matthew 5. I mentioned this in our church hour. This is from the CDC, Center for Disease Control, COVID-19 or the coronavirus. The virus is thought to spread mainly from person to person. Duh. Between people who are in close contact with one another within about six feet, via respiratory droplets produced when an infected person coughs or sneezes, these droplets can land in the mouths or noses of people who are nearby or possibly be inhaled into the lungs. That is true of any kind of influenza. That is true of your seasonal cold uh, and allergies, for that matter. That is true uh, every year. And under a section concerning prevention and treatment, there is currently no vaccine to prevent coronavirus disease. COVID-19. The best way to prevent illness is to avoid being exposed. That goes without saying. The Center for Disease Control always recommends everyday preventive actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases, including avoid close contact with people who are sick. Well, that's true every year when it's cold season. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. That's true all the time. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze with a tissue, then throw the tissue in the trash. Well, who would want to hang on to it, you know? Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces using a regular, now notice I said a regular household cleaning spray or wipe. It doesn't say soak all of your belongings in bleach. Wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before eating, after blowing your nose, coughing, or sneezing. Well, that's like the signs in all the restaurant bathrooms. Yave sus manos para la sanidad. Right? Wash your hands for better health. If soap and water are not readily available, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. We've got them spread out throughout the church. I was at a church the other day and uh, through my job, and for uh, the season of Lent, the Catholic Church not only, they used to cover the statues, they're not, some churches may still do, but a lot of churches used to cover the statues during the 40 days of Lent. I don't know what the symbolism of that is, uh, and on Good Friday is the one day of the year they do not have Mass and consecrate the supposed uh, host and uh, body and blood of Christ. Uh, but they also get rid of the holy water um, containers inside the entrance of the churches. Uh, I was at a church the other day and they've replaced the little cups of holy water with those automatic hand sanitizers <laughs> on both sides. All the doors had those automatic motion detector hand sanitizers installed. Good for them. Uh, that'll probably do more for them than worrying about uh, putting a drop of water on your forehead and the sign of the cross. This was an article from CNN. I'm surprised it made it CNN's news cycle. A Seattle woman who says she had the coronavirus and is recovering has one big takeaway to share. Don't panic. Elizabeth Schneider, 37 now, obviously she's younger than the average um, age that they worry that's uh, susceptible, believes she contracted the virus at a house party because a few days later, several friends who were at the party became ill at the same time. Three days after the February 22nd party, Schneider says she was at work when she started feeling unwell. She was feeling tired, body aches, getting a headache, feeling a little bit feverish, so she decided to go home. She woke up from a nap with a 101-degree fever, and, quote, by the time I went to bed, it had soared to 103 degrees. The Seattle area is the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak in the U.S. Schneider said she recovered after staying home, resting, and taking over-the-counter medications. 
I think the big takeaway I want to tell everyone is, please don't panic. And because she said that, that's why I wonder how it even made it into the news cycle, because the whole purpose of the news in the United States is to uh, cause everyone to panic. Actually, they, CNN did find somebody to say what they wanted to say. Quote, the grim reality is that for the elderly, COVID-19 is almost a perfect killing machine, unquote. American Health Care Association President Mark Parkinson told CNN this week. See, they had to throw that in. They had to find somebody to say something contrary to it. Do you know something? The grim reality is that for the elderly, regular influenza is almost a perfect killing machine. That's why I say I, I don't understand how excess toilet paper is going to help. There's another article. I'm a 42-year-old woman, a little bit older, who got the new coronavirus. This has been the hardest part. That's the headline. On Friday, March 6th, I was sitting in my living room when I got the voicemail message that just said, call me back in an urgent tone. That's when I knew that I had tested positive for the new coronavirus, uh, also known as COVID-19. I'm fine now, mostly a little short of breath with an occasional cough, but it's been an experience. She said, uh, on Friday, February 28th, I woke up with a sore throat and headache. I work from home, and by noon, I felt so under the weather that I had to stop working. By 2 p.m., 2 in the afternoon, I had chills and body aches and a mild fever of 100.2 degrees Fahrenheit that was gone within a half hour after I took Advil. By 3 p.m. I was in bed and stayed there well into the next day. Initially I thought it was the flu. She said by Saturday, February, 20, February 29th, I went to a clinic near my home and had my temperature taken again, 100.5 degrees Fahrenheit. The nurse I saw gave me Tamiflu, an antiviral for the flu. Uh, truthfully for me, the illness hasn't been that bad. A couple of years ago, I got the flu and found that to be worse. It's been almost two weeks now, and I'm just getting over it, which is similar to the experience I've had with any cold or flu. And the previous letter... The lady said... Um, Oh, I already read that to you. Said she recovered. Schneider said she recovered after staying home, resting, taking over-the-counter medications. And as uh, I mentioned at the beginning of our church hour, 10 years ago, 18,000 people in the United States died from the swine flu, the N1H1 or H1N1. Right now, 41 people have died here in the U.S., uh, as a result of the coronavirus. The reason some people get flu shots each year and still get sick is because the vaccines aren't designed to cover every possible mutation or strain of the flu or influenza. Right now, COVID-19, the coronavirus, is a new strain, it seems to me, from all the reports that we get of some other respiratory or influenza virus that there is no vaccine for yet. It's a new strain that they hadn't seen before. And they're working to develop one. And grant you, don't anyone think Pastor Shribe says it's nothing. Nobody wants to catch it. I don't want to catch it. And I don't want any one of our church members to catch it. I don't want anyone watching our sermons online to catch it. But uh, the panic, the hysteria, is spreading faster than the virus is. You can go down to the uh, Dollar Tree 99 cent only store, and they've got plenty of toilet paper. But my wife said, I don't want to get the cheap stuff. And I said, well, just double it over if you have to. <laughs> but um, so, uh, like I asked, uh, I don't think extra toilet paper is going to save you when hordes of marauding Democrats come walk and Bernie Sanders voters come walking down the street uh, wanting to plunder 
uh, your possessions and take your firearms and take your bank accounts away from you. And that's what they want to do. All right, let's go to our Bible study. Let me have you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. I get a lot of comments under our YouTube video for that this week. That's all right. But if you're one of those panicking, thinking the world's coming to an end, uh, you haven't been reading your Bible. The world's not coming to an end. There was an old joke back in the 70s about the news reports. You know, you see these little updates between commercials. Uh, the world comes to an end at 10 o'clock. Film at 11. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5. And we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount. The entire audience was Jewish. They were still living under Old Testament conditions. Christ had not died. He hadn't been buried or resurrected yet. There was no new birth being preached or offered yet. It is, it is not the plan of salvation today. Its application will have to be primarily to the Jew and um, secondarily, devotionally, to the believer. But verse 13, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Salt has always been um, an, a valuable commodity through the world, throughout history. Uh, the Bible commands its offering with every sacrifice. Go back, if you will, to Leviticus chapter 2. Leviticus chapter 2. And Leviticus 2, notice there verse 13. Leviticus 2, verse 13. And every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. And God referred to it as a covenant of salt all again in Numbers 18, verse 19. Notice, if you will, Job Chapter 6, Job 6, and Job 6, notice verse 6. Can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt, or is there any taste in the white of an egg? Dr. Ruckman would, would say that the Bible is even a commentary on French cooking because they make meringue out of egg whites, based on that verse. He had a great way of illustrating the Bible in, in um, uh, everyday expressions. Uh, that part of Israel that remained faithful to God was always the salt of the earth. Look back at Genesis 12. Genesis 12. Genesis 12, and notice here verses 1, 2, and 3. Genesis 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And the fate of nations was tied to their treatment of the Jew. Look also at Genesis 27. Genesis 27. Notice there verse 29. Let people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee, be Lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee, 
and blessed be he that blesseth thee. Uh, and likewise, Exodus 23, Exodus 23, Exodus 23, and notice there, verse 22. Exodus 23, verse 22. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. Uh, of course, that supposes that Israel is going to remain faithful to God and then other nations' fate will be tied to their treatment of Israel. I... I believe with all of my heart that the economic prosperity the United States has had over the last three years in particular are somehow related to the fact that we moved our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem in 2017 and in so doing recognized Jerusalem as the rightful capital of the state of Israel and the uh, Jewish people. And uh, we don't have to come to Israel's rescue and defend them militarily, they are more than capable of protecting themselves militarily. Some of the most high-tech weapons systems um, implemented in the world will be found among the Jewish army. You remember the, the uh, Six-Day War and the Jews' decimation of all these Arab nations uh, uh, aligned against them it was miraculous. It was a, a modern-day miracle in front of the world's face that God was behind the nation of Israel. God was supporting the nation of Israel. But a Christian can also be likened to salt. Uh, inspirationally speaking, he should make people thirsty for Christ if he can. Uh, his life and his witness should have a, a bite to it once in a while. Look forward at Galatians chapter, or rather Colossians chapter 4. Colossians Colossians 4 verse 6. Colossians 4 verse 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt that you may know how ye ought to answer every man. And back to our text, Matthew 5, verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Paul tells Christians, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 5. He says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Philippians 2, verse 15. Go back, if you will, to John, or rather to John, chapter 8. John 8 and um, 1 verse there, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And also John 9, John chapter 9, verse 5. He says, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. John wrote of Christ, that was the true light that lighteth every man which cometh into the world. John 1, verse 9. As lights in the world, you can only reflect his light. You're not the light, but only to the degree that you are reflecting the light of Jesus Christ. Now, the ye in Matthew 5, 14, ye are the light of the world, was Israel. First and foremost, the entire history of of the Jewish people was one continual testimony on behalf of God. 
It should have been one continual testimony to God, a testimony to his protection, a testimony to his deliverance, a testimony to his provision for them. When atheists discount the Jewish people in the Old Testament as being a group of um, unlearned, uneducated, Bronze Age Hebrews who knew nothing about germ theory or microorganisms. Christopher Hitchens was great at this. They thought they were pleasing the mysterious man in the sky by circumcising their private parts and try to refer to this as barbaric in every sense of the word that he could come up with. Uh, they only reveal their own level of ignorance of the God of the Bible. They were told to wash their infected flesh in running water. Leviticus 15, verse 13. If you want to write these references down as we go. Running water, not stagnant water. Leviticus 15, verse 13. When someone showed signs of pos possible leprosy, they were to be quarantined for observation uh, by the priest. And you know how long he was to observe them? 14 days. He'd look at them for one week, and if no change, look at, uh, observe them for another week. And after two weeks, he'd make a determination whether they're unclean or if they're clean, because there'd been no noticeable change. An infected person needed to cover his mouth and declare himself unclean to warn others who would approach. Leviticus 13, verse 45. Uh, if your clothes were also contaminated, they were to be incinerated. Leviticus 13, verse 57. The Jews were told to dig latrines to keep their camp clean. Keep it sanitary, Deuteronomy 23, verses 12 and 13. The UN and the World Health Organization organizations recommend circumcision even today in 2020, especially in underdeveloped nations, to prevent the spread of diseases. So there was a benefit to it. And you can find multiple websites on the internet now extolling the health benefits of a kosher diet. The Jews didn't need to understand God's commands. They were expected to obey God's commands. And the health benefits would come to them as well if they did so. God's not someone who has to answer my questions or your questions as to why. One thing that can really be, unless a parent has just tremendous patience, and I suppose mothers have more patience than fathers do, but the continually asking, why this, why that, why this, why that? I don't know how I'm constituted, and I'm thankful I didn't have to encounter that with my children. I suppose they had asked their mom all day long before I came home from work. So they were all asked out, perhaps by the time I got home every afternoon. But I don't know that I'm constituted to endure a continual asking of why, 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 why this daddy, why that daddy. And uh, nor is God interested in having to answer your questions because there'll be just another question after that. That's the mentality of the skeptic, the uh, agnostic, the atheist, who doesn't want to believe in God anyway. Show me a miracle, and then I'll believe. So you see something, then you find some um, natural explanation for what you think uh, is responsible for it. You know, every year in the news, somewhere in the news cycle, on television, news report, there'll be some so-called expert telling us how the Red Sea crossing actually took place. And if you look at the maps in the backs of most Bibles, it shows the route of the Exodus going way up near the shallow waters at the headwaters of the, uh, um, where the Nile 
uh, meets the, the uh, Red Sea. And uh, what we, what we uh, refer to as the Jews crossing the Reed Sea, where it's very shallow marshes rather than deep water. And they say a natural wind would come by and push the water uh, out of the way and did so long enough for them to cross through. And uh, with embellishing the story, they made it sound as though they were crossing with great walls of water on both sides uh, over the centuries. So the story kept being told and retold. Every year that story is recycled in television news in the media. Uh, if we can uh, reject what the Bible plainly says and find some naturalistic explanation for it instead, then we can go on living how we want and reject the Bible, reject the imperative that a man's a sinner, he needs to be forgiven by God and born again. Look at verse 14 again. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Now a city that is set on a hill, the immediate reference would be to Jerusalem. It's set on a hill with other hills around it. Uh, the Mount of Olives is to its east. Another mount called Mount Scopus, S-C-O-P-U-S, uh, to its north and what's called the Hill of Evil Council to its immediate south. And uh, uh, Jerusalem cannot be hid regardless of its elevation. And from what I understand, its elevation is slightly below uh, one or maybe two of those other hills. Look forward at Matthew 5 and verses 34 and 35. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. That is prophetic. Jerusalem is the city of the great king, and it's from Jerusalem. The king of kings will one day reign. Here, Matthew chapter 5 Verses 15 and 16. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Also look forward at Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Luke 8, notice there verse 16. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, cover it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. A vessel is something used to carry something else. So the word bushel uh, is a short abbreviation for a bushel basket. You carry a a basket of peaches or apples or whatever the fruit is you've harvested, you carry it from one place to the other in that bushel or in that basket. And uh, the, the point is no man lights a candle and covers, a, covers it with a basket so you can't see it any longer. Look also at um, Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Mark 4, um, verse 21. And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick? The words bushel and bed, they've uh, inspired a lot of great sermon preaching and sermon uh, illustration over the years. The two dangers to have an effective or an effectual witness and testimony in the life of a Christian are, number one, commercialism. That would be the bushel, having to do with merchandise in some form, and laziness. That would be the bed. Two things 
people can put before living for God. I'm too caught up in my job. I'm too caught up in my career and income. I'm too caught up in personal pursuits. I'm too consumed and caught up with getting ahead at my job or getting another promotion at my job or making that sales quota at my job or getting to a certain income level through this reason, that reason, or another reason. Um, and I'll try to witness if I get a chance to. I'll try to witness if I think about it. Or I can do that next Saturday. I, I can do that next week. I don't have to go uh, to the Bible study this week. I can go next week. Um, I don't have to make it to church this Sunday. I'm usually there, uh, but family, the kids want to go to Disneyland. They want to go to Knott's Berry Farm. They want to go up to the mountains. They want to go down to the beach. We have company visiting, and they want to do some sightseeing and some shopping. And so they they put off their spiritual obligations, and they put off uh, taking their life as a believer seriously. And that's the laziness part. Commercialism and laziness, those two things can cover up the light of Jesus Christ, the light uh, that ought to show forth from your testimony. But verse 16 again, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Notice the good works do not shine, but the light is what shines. If you witness and if you let your faith in Jesus Christ be known, people will start to watch you. People will start to watch you. And um, your works, your actions will either compromise your testimony or they will complement your testimony. They may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That is sound advice to anyone in any age, be it Jew before Calvary or a believer after Calvary. Your actions, your life ought to match your profession. Now, there are a lot of people who don't believe in rightly dividing the word of truth. And when the book of James says, now faith without works is dead, they simply dismiss it in a devotional sense and say, well, if you claim to have a certain faith, then your actions should show it. And they say, well, that's all there is to it. But if you rightly divide the word of truth, you'll, you'll soon discover that your actions amount to nothing in trying to earn God's favor, in trying to earn God's righteousness to get to heaven. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, Ephesians 2.10. So you're not saved by works, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, but you're saved for the purpose of works afterwards. Now, devotionally, yeah, your life should match what you profess, but that does not get you into heaven at all. Good works don't get you there at all. But uh, if, you profess, if the Jew professed a faith in the Lord God of the Hebrew Scriptures, his life should match it. His life should have matched it and lived up to the holy exacting standards of a God, of God who had nurtured that na nation and separated and formed that nation from Abraham on. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. And once again, your Father was uh, a phrase given to Israel. Christ never prayed, Our Father. And we talked about this last Sunday in our sermon time when I preached about rightly dividing the Lord's Prayer. It was their privilege to address God as their Father nationally. 